Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Tara Teal. I'm a professor in the Department of Human Dimensions and Natural Resources. And this is the first seminar in our series this semester, or this year, um, in the Human Wildlife Interaction Series. And this started last year. It was actually a collaboration uh, between the Department of Human Dimensions and Natural Resources and the Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology. And our hope with this series was not only to bring in some exciting speakers, but also to be able to promote collaboration across the departments and beyond um, to work on human wildlife issues. So we'll be having speakers throughout the year. Um, we're starting off with our visiting scholars that we're hosting in the department right now. So our first one today is Dr. Ruth Kansky. And Ruth is from Stellenbosch University in South Africa. Um, she's a visiting scholar in our department. She's a postdoctoral fellow, actually supported by Volkswagen through a fellowship. And she's an interdisciplinary conservation biologist with a background in zoology working in southern Africa. Her area of expertise is in wildlife management and governance, with a particular focus on biodiversity conflict issues. Her PhD research focused on identifying drivers of human tolerance, which I know she'll talk more about today, um, towards living with damage-causing wildlife. And currently, she's working on a project in Zambia and Namibia on human-wildlife coexistence issues, which I know she'll define more for us today. Um, in addition to having her PhD from Stellenbosch, she also has a postgraduate diploma in project monitoring and evaluation, and she's done a lot of trainings on conflict resolution, so how to deal with complex biodiversity conflicts, including conflicts with wildlife and bringing diverse stakeholders um, in different communities together. Um, so with that, I'll introduce Dr. Kansky. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Okay, so um, as Tara mentioned, um, I'm from Stellenbosch University in South Africa, and I'm doing a, a three-year postdoc funded by the Volkswagen Foundation. So one of the aims of this program is, in addition to doing a research project, is also to develop and grow the Fellows International Network and provide funding to visit a mentor. So. As part of this program, um, I'm visiting Prof. Manfredo and, and Tara in this department, so thanks very much for hosting me. And um, so what I wanted to do today in this presentation is to just give a general overview of my research, and then hopefully um, I can meet some of you um, in the next weeks while I'm here and discuss similar research interests. So um, today I'm going to start off by talking about um, the wildlife tolerance model, which I developed as part of my PhD. And then I'll summarize some of the findings from a few um, case studies which we've applied um, globally. Um, and then I'll move <coughs> to um, talk about the social learning component of my current postdoc project in the Kavango Zambezi Transfrontier conservation area, and more specifically about a communication tool that we've used called nonviolent communication. So as I d mentioned, I developed this wildlife tolerance model as part of my PhD thesis, and it's an interdisciplinary theory for application to human wildlife conflict research and management and aims to incorporate the complexity of managing human wildlife conflicts and also to be a diagnostic tool to inform management interventions and policies. So I developed this model because I was interested to understand why some people are more tolerant than others in living with damage causing wildlife. So it's well established that people vary in their tolerance to living with wildlife. For example, why some people, some farmers are prepared to spend the whole day guarding their crops from primates or invest in guard dogs to protect their livestock, uh, while others prefer to trap and kill. So initial research in human wildlife conflict focused on the physical and biological variables that can contribute to damage. Um, oops. 
Um, while at the same time, other research focused on finding technological solutions to mitigating the monetary impacts of wildlife, with the assumption that damage is the most important factor affecting tolerance of people. However, later research suggested that this assumption may be too simplistic, as damage mitigation did not always increase tolerance, and people living with wildlife were not always willing to implement mitigation measures to reduce the damage. So Dickman in 2010, in a qualitative review, concluded that the causes of conflict are often complex and deep-seated, and a broader approach must be utilized. And Frank et al. concluded that while we already have most of the techniques necessary to manage depredation, the solutions lie in the realm of policy, social science, and politics. So while a number of qualitative reviews had been undertaken and a variety of factors identified as being important in explaining tolerance, no quantitative reviews had been undertaken that covered a variety of species. So my first task was to conduct uh, a meta-analysis. Um, so we know that for a particular species and sites, which factors are important, but we don't know if these factors would also be important for a different species and in a different context. So my thinking was if we could determine if there are any particular groups of factors that are always more important than others, irrespective of the species and culture, it would allow us to design interventions and policies that can be applied at a broader scale, such as regional country or even a global scale. So for this uh, meta-analysis, I focused on these four groups of mammals as they often come into conflict with people. Many are threatened and occur outside protected areas, meaning their survival depends on the willingness of communities to tolerate them. So more specifically in this meta-analysis, I wanted to find out to what extent are the costs associated with living with wildlife the main factor in dr driving tolerance, which factors have been investigated by researchers, and are there any factors or groups of factors that are always more important. So this meta-analysis is published as two papers, and I'm not going to talk about these papers in this presentation, but I invite you to have a look at them. Um, but I just want to make one point about these reviews, is that it was possible to rank the variables according to the importance in driving tolerant attitudes towards different wildlife species. So based on these findings, as well as consulting, consulting other disciplines in order to capture the complexity of human wildlife conflict as embedded in complex social ecological systems. I also consulted other literature such as the Common Pools Resources, uh, Social Psychology, Environmental Psychology, Environmental Economics, Religious Studies and Human Animal Relations. And um, based on this, I developed the wildlife tolerance model. So um, I'll explain in more detail the, the model. So the model consists of two components, an outer model and an inner model. And in the outer model, experience is the first variable and is operationalized as recent exposure to a species and the number of meaningful experiences a person has had with the species. So experiences can either be positive or negative. Next, we have benefits and costs. These are separated into tangible and intangible. So tangible refers to the monetary costs and benefits, while intangible refers to the non-monetary value. Um, sorry, the, the non-monetary values such as fear or stress due to a species or the existence values of a species. So the first prediction of the model is that experience drives perceptions of costs and benefits. So if experiences are more positive than negative, the scale will tilt towards greater perceptions of benefits and vice versa with negative experiences and costs. 
And then the second hypothesis is that costs and benefit perceptions drive tolerance. So in the inner model, um, we have 11 variables that are predicted to impact on perceptions of costs and benefits. For example, um, if we take interest in animals, the prediction here is that people who are more interested in animals will perceive relatively more benefits than costs and therefore will be more tolerant than those who dislike animals. So I won't go into much details about how all these variables were operationalized, but I'll just mention um, the tolerance construct, which consists of uh, four dimensions. Uh, tolerance to killing under seven scenarios of increasing severity. Tolerance to population increase of a species at three scales, the local, regional, and continental. Tolerance to spatial proximity at three distances and tolerance to monetary damage. So to date, we have applied the wildlife tolerance model to 17 different species across eight different countries. And this work has been possible due to a very fruitful collaboration with Andrew Knight and his students from Imperial College in the UK. So Andrew was my PhD supervisor at Stellenbosch, but when he moved on to run the Masters in Conservation Science at Imperial, um, it was these master students who have been applying the, the model across the globe. So we have um, Irene Shivdi and Filippo Marino applying it on bears and wolves in Italy. Um, Lauren Wiseman Jones applying it on baboons, chimps, and elephants in Uganda. Omar Saif applied it to elephants in Bangladesh. And Amy van Gelder applied it to leopards, langurs, and cobras in India. And I've applied um, the model in three case studies um, for baboons on the Cape Peninsula in South Africa and for lion, kudu, elephants, baboons, and hyenas in Zambia and Namibia. So we use partial least square structural equation models to assess the relationships between the variables in the wildlife tolerance model. And if we draw the model to reflect the outputs of a structural equation model, it looks more or less like this. So just to recap, in the outer model, hypothesis one predicts that experience <coughs> operationalized as exposure and meaningful events to a species drives um, perceptions of costs and benefits. And then hypothesis two predicts that costs and benefits drive tolerance. And then the third set of hypotheses predicts the impact of the inner model variables where they can mediate or moderate the relationship between costs and benefits and tolerance. So these are some of the path model diagrams from the case studies and it all looks a bit rather overwhelming to try and make sense. But what I did is I created um, this table um, so for each path, I recorded in this table uh, whether they were found to be statistically significant or not. And then I calculated a percentage of significance or not for all the species combined. What I just want to point out in this table is that the R square value for each species. Um, so this indicates the overall amount of variation in tolerance explained by the preceding variables in the model. So what we see is a range from 0.3 to 0.6. So between 30% and 60% of variation in tolerance is explained by the model. And I just want to point out that for each case study, not all the inner model variables were asked in the surveys because there were various limitations to survey length. So these R-square values may include some inner model variables or no, none. So this is a summary of the overall proportion of times the path was found to be significant or not. 
<coughs> and it looks pretty chaotic, but I'll just try and point out a few um, key patterns. So firstly, the path from exposure to tangible costs was significant in 80% of the 15 species. So the more a person is exposed to a species, the more monetary costs they incur. But in 93% of the cases, higher costs do not lead to reduced tolerance. So monetary costs are not significant drivers of tolerance, mostly. Um, this means that reducing the exposure to a species will not increase tolerance. It is possible that wealth or income may play impact on whether monetary costs drive tolerance. For example, a rich person may not worry about higher monetary damage. But we see that wealth was not a significant moderator of tolerance in 93% of the cases where it was examined. We also see that uh, monetary benefits were not significant in 100% of the cases. And then the third point is that intangible benefits and um, intangible costs are significant drivers of tolerance. Um, so these are important drivers of tolerance. So how could we reduce the, tangible, the intangible costs and increase the intangible benefits? For cost intangible, we see that exposure was a significant driver of cost intangible, but negative meaningful events and positive meaningful events are mostly not significant, although in some cases they are. So depending on the species, one could try to reduce these negative um, experiences and increase the positive experiences. For benefit intangible, we see that exposure is mostly not significant, while negative meaningful events and positive meaningful events have a 50% chance of being significant. So one would have to manage this on a case-by-case -case situation. And lastly, for um, I'm just showing here two of the, the model variables, we see that empathy is, most, is significant in 90% of the cases, um, but the wildlife value orientations are mostly not significant. Between only between 12 and 37 percent of cases were they significant. So just to conclude this um, um, bit of uh, the talk, so the wildlife tolerance model can explain between 30 to 60 percent of variation in tolerance. And the monetary costs generally do not drive tolerance, but the non-monetary costs, non-monetary benefits and empathy most, most strongly drive tolerance. Intangible costs and intangible benefits could be modified through exposure, positive meaningful events and negative meaning events, but variation between species is high and therefore management will need to target each species on a case-by-case -case basis. So now I will talk a bit about the social learning component of my project in Namibia, which is the second part of the project entitled Sustainable Human Wildlife Coexistence in the Anthropocene, the Kavango Zimbizi Transfrontier Conservation Area in Southern Africa. But before that, I'll just give a bit of background on the project. So for this project, I chose to work in the Kavango Zambezi Transfrontier Conservation Area, which is the largest of 18 transfrontier um, parks in Southern Africa. It is situated in the Okavango and Zambezi River basins and is an initiative of the governments of Angola, Botswana, Namibia, Zambia and Zimbabwe that aims to jointly manage and conserve both natural and cultural heritage resources, as well as implement programs to improve the livelihoods of resident communities. 
So one of the rationales for the creation of CASA is to allow the persistence of wildlife dispersal areas for large mammals such as elephant, buffalo and zebra, as indicated by these um, coloured arrows. So I chose to work in the Kwando wildlife dispersal area of CASA, in the area around Mudumu National Park in Namibia and Sioma Nkwezi National Park in Zambia. And I chose these two countries because they have quite different wildlife policies in terms of the benefits communities can get from sharing the landscape with wildlife. So my hypothesis was that people in Namibia would be more tolerant towards wildlife than in Zambia because Namibia has a CBNRM program where members receive many benefits from wildlife, while in Zambia communities only have costs from living with wildlife. But I won't be presenting these results today because um, I presented them at the Pathways Conference. So the Casa landscape consists of a mosaic of different land use types, where 71% is under some form of wildlife management, leaving 29% for agricultural use and development. Um, it is also home to 27 million people. So given this mixture of land use types and developmental pressures, not surprisingly, the wildlife corridors are threatened. And human wildlife conflict is a key challenge. So key questions for managing wildlife in such a mixed agri-conservation landscape is what factors drive people's tolerance to living with wildlife and what policies are best to achieve this. So the main goal of my project was to engage stakeholders and community members living and working in CASA in a social learning process to foster human wildlife coexistence. And to achieve this, I had four objectives. So the first component was to conduct community surveys to determine the impact of wild animals on livelihoods and factors driving tolerance towards living with different animal species. And for this, of course, I used the wildlife tolerance model as a theoretical framework. The second objective, which was a master's project, was to analyze the governance of conservancies around Mudumu National Park in Namibia to evaluate the outcomes for wildlife and people with specific fo focus on human wildlife conflict management. And for this, we used um, Bostrom's design principles as a theoretical framework. The third objective was to engage stakeholders in a social learning process to build capacity, integrate diverse stakeholders' knowledge systems, and build tolerance and consensus among stakeholders. And the fourth objective was then to co-create community management plans to adaptively manage human-wildlife interactions. Um, however, during the social learning um, process, we decided to change this objective to rather co-create and design projects to address some of the issues that came out of the social learning. So what is social learning? Social learning aims to produce innovative solutions to complex problems by bringing together stakeholders with different worldviews, opinions and values. And the idea is that if you bring them together in a safe space with good facilitation skills, with good facilitation that is conducive, conducive to interaction, reflection and deliberation, um, shifts in worldview um, can take place, which can lead to innovation and adaptation. And to facilitate this process, I use a communication tool called Nonviolent Communication, or NVC for short. So NVC was developed by Marshall Rosenberg in the, in the 60s. And he became a traveling peacemaker who dedicated his life to the study and practice of the conditions that bring about peace. And the symbolic animal used in nonviolent communication is the giraffe, 
because it is the land animal with the largest heart and so it's very compassionate. So a key component of social learning is self-reflection and NVC is particularly good for this. So NVC is a practical, emotionally intelligent, awareness-based communication process for interaction with oneself and others rooted in Gandhi's theory and philosophy of nonviolence. It is a particular approach to conflict that emphasizes honest expression and empathic listening, recognizing our common humanity even in the midst of our most difficult moments together. So nonviolent communication tries to move out of a paradigm of judgment, evaluation, and criticism language that is life alienating and does not serve to build connection and compassion between people to one of empathy and universal human needs. And the underlying assumption is that meeting universal human needs is key to human well-being. And human behaviors are strategies employed to meet these basic universal human needs. So I'll just um, unpack the concept of universal human needs a bit more. So universal human needs are common to all human beings because they are ontolo ontological, <laughs> which means that they arise out of the condition of being human. They are also different to wants or strategies. For example, I want a car or I want a chocolate which are strategies to meet universal human needs. So while wants and strategies are infinite in number, universal human needs are few, finite, and classifiable. So um, here are examples of a needs list um, by Marshall Rosenberg. And he um, identifies seven main categories so connection, physical well-being, autonomy, peace, meaning, honesty, and play. And then under each of these main categories are more specific needs. For example, under autonomy are needs for choice and freedom, and under meaning are needs for challenge, creativity, and effectiveness. So two classic quotes of Marshall Rosenberg are, in every moment, each of us is trying to meet our needs in the best way that we know. And judgments and violence are tragic expressions of unmet needs. And an example that he often uses um, of a tragic expression of an unmet need is when he was doing NVC training in prisons. And after one prisoner learned about needs, he told Marshall, Wow, if I knew I was trying to meet my need for respect, I would not have killed my best friend. <laughs> so human needs theorists argue that conflict and even violence are inevitable because human needs are non-negotiable. And universal human needs are constant through all human cultures and across historical time periods. What changes over time and between cultures is the strategies by which needs are satisfied. So now I'll just talk about how we use this nonviolent communication in our social learning workshops in four conservancies in Namibia. So our program consisted of three types of workshops. For the first type, we recruited conservancy members who were farmers and had problems with wildlife. They also had to be motivated to be change leaders in their community and commit to the eight week, pro eight week program, which turned out to be nine weeks. And it consisted of half a day once a week for nine weeks. Um, and there were four different groups, one for each conservancy. The second type of workshops were scenario planning workshops, which were conducted by my German partners, Jörn Fischer, Tolera Jiren, and Mariah Reichers. And I won't be talking about um, this much today. And the third type of workshop was the wrap-up um, workshops, um, where we 
did um, some project design train training. So I'm just going to talk a bit about the type one workshops. So for the first four weeks, um, we did NVC training and group dialogues on various topics related to living with wildlife. <coughs> so we spoke about the good things and the challenging things about living with wildlife. We built some sculptures to depict the present scenarios of how it was um, for participants to live with wildlife. And then they had to change the sculptures to see what they wanted the future to be. Um, we spoke about the people that impact on how they live with wildlife. Um, cultural stories around wildlife. We did role play dialogues with wildlife. And we also studied the conservancy policies and shared mitigation measures to prevent damage and how to behave with wildlife. Then from weeks five to nine, we invited um, guests to the workshops to have um, dialogues. Um, these were mainly from the conservancy management. And we also continued to learn and practice the nonviolent communication. And then also in the last three weeks, we started brainstorming projects for the groups to implement um, after the program was finished. So this is just a picture to show the setting of the workshops, in case you've all fallen asleep by now. Mm -hmm. And um, this is one of the sculptures that participants built, um, depicting how it was for them to live with wildlife. So I've not yet formally analysed the results um, from these workshops as I just recently got back from the field, but I just wanted to sh share some um, impressions that I have so far. So it seems that participants um, did show increased empathy towards wildlife. So at the beginning of each new session, we spent about 30 minutes reflecting on how the previous uh, workshop had changed the way they think or behave and they came up with some um, interesting stories each week. So for example one uh, story was about um, that one of the participants told was when he was walking in the bush and he saw a hyena chasing an impala and then the impala ran up and stood next to him <laughs> And the hyena came towards the impala, but when it saw um, Duskin, the participant, it ran away. And in the past, Duskin said he would have let the hyena catch the, the impala and then chased the hyena away so that he could get the meat. But since learning that animals also have universal human needs, he had empathy for the impala. <laughs> He also noticed that the impala was pregnant, so he was happy that he had saved two lives. Another participant shared how before the lessons she used to get annoyed with the ground squirrels coming into her yard and she would chase them away. But now she tolerates them and her grandchildren enjoy watching them now. Um, another participant told of how since he has moved to live with his girlfriend, a family of monkeys had moved into his house and he has not removed them. In the past, he said they would have just trapped and killed them. And he's also seen that it's a female and she has young. So these are just some of the kinds of stories that people were reporting. Um, there also seemed to be increased empathy towards um, other people. So we heard many stories of participants resolving conflicts in their community and personal transformations. As one a participant, Makena, said, it seems we are all very ill-tempered people before we attended these workshops. <laughs> one participant shared that he was able to win a court case due to the communication skills he'd learned, and others talked about feeling empowered to speak out in public meetings, and others also reported um, that they'd been given leadership roles in their communities. And we also had um, a case where some participants 
um, agreed to move out of a core wildlife area, which had been a big contentious issue in the community where they'd been grazing their cattle. So at the end of the workshops, participants received certificates, which they were very proud about. Mm -hmm. And so just to end off, um, I just wanted to show um, two short video clips of participants talking about the impact of the workshops. Um, but before that, I'll just quickly say uh, thanks to all my um, colleagues who've um, collaborated on these various aspects of the project. I need to tell it, uh, I need to tell a lot of things. Yeah, like, whenever I was at home, if I see a common decker just passing around, I would chase with, with my dogs. But when I uh, started attending this workshop, like, uh, I was now planning myself to say, actually, what I used to do chasing those animals with dogs, I think uh, that was a bad idea. <laughs> so uh, I've learned from Tutalov that uh, uh, on how we should also live, with, how humans uh, should live with wildlife. Like it's not good to just be killing animals anyhow or uh, inflicting harm to, to, to others or other people. Like how to approach someone is also, it's also important, but it's also very important. For example, if let's say someone, let's say your friend wants to talk to you and maybe you are busy at that time, it's important that you, you have a listen ear for that person.
Okay, yeah, I think that's all today. Yeah, so thanks everyone. That's we have a good amount of time for questions. Could you, could you give me some examples of intangible costs of wildlife? Um, so in the survey, what we um, use is um, um, sort of negative emotions around living with wildlife, so feelings of fear and stress or worry. And then um, also we ask, have statements around um, things like, it's difficult for me to live with wildlife because I worry about the safety of my children or family um, or because I don't get enough support from the authorities or because I have to be vigilant at all times. Mm -hmm. So things like that. I have actually have questions along the same lines. I was just curious about the intangible benefits and meaningful events also. It looked like there was a, um, a negative meaningful event had positive benefits in your flow chart, so I was just curious about how that... Um, no, it would be an inverse relationship. So the more negative, um, meaningful experiences you have, the, um, yeah, the more, the more non-monetary costs and the less benefits. Can you say that again? The more negative. Um, the more negative events you have. The more negative experiences a person has, the more um, costs they will perceive, more intangible costs and the less intangible benefits. Mm. Could you explain the demographics of the people that you've studied, their property size, their number of animals, type of animals, and then give some of the tangible issues that you were dealing with? Um, so the tangible um, costs are strictly the monetary costs, so we converted like all the damage that people experience, crop damage or livestock loss into monetary value so um, yeah so these are people that live in conservancies and they're mostly um, small-scale farmers so they have um, cattle anything from one to there's some quite wealthy cattle owners who often live in towns not actually in the rural areas they can have up to 200 cattle and then um, crop farmers, so people grow 
sometimes they have little vegetable gardens, but also sort of cash crops like maize and sorghum and millet and yeah, those are the main. And the issues they encountered? In terms of wildlife damage? Yeah, yeah. so um, I can't remember off the top, um, but it is quite severe, so I think um, Yeah, I mean, the, the, the species that cause damage are elephants um, and then the predators, hyenas and lions, and then uh, primates, their baboons, and also um, ungulates, kudu and impala and bush pig are a big problem, and porcupines. Um, yeah. Thanks a lot. I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, some of the, not necessarily the, the, the structural equation models, but more kind of interpretation of them and, and how generalizable you think they are. Uh, it was it was it was this really really neat empirical effort, right? Like the a similar survey was asking all these different systems, and then I I guess. Were there multiple models estimated for each system? And then you did sort of a qualitative summary of all of those individual models into a, into a single model that you were talking and walking through some of the path effects there? No, that was really just a descriptive sort of thing. So with structural equation models, it's, um, these are partial least squares, structural mm -hmm. equation models. So they're quite different to the um, covariance-based um, structural models. So you don't have different model. You don't really have a model <coughs> fit. You just have. You basically test for um, various sort of reliability and validity tests for the construct fit, mm -hmm. and then once you have those sort of um, um, you happy with them, <laughs> kind of they fit the various parameters then you um, you do the path model mm -hmm. and then you get um, yeah whether either the paths are significant or not and you get the R square value for the overall fit of the model. So it is it is kind of a more exploratory sort of um, method, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well I guess maybe I can frame that a little bit differently. Um, so The data that 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 were that you were using to estimate the models was it a single observation from each site, or were you gathering data from each site that you used to then estimate separate models? So each site is a is a separate survey in itself. So mm -hmm. we collect between right. like two hundred and forty and yeah, yeah, yeah. six hundred. Yeah. Yeah. So so I guess what I was asking is is thinking about the the global model. Yeah. Whether whether conceptually or empirically, were you able to notice species effects within that model? I guess sorry, that was a, a roundabout way of getting there, but I'm curious, like if, if you know you're looking at these systems that are as different as examining people's perceptions and, and impacts from interactions with snakes versus elephants versus baboons. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm interested in, in, in how different those species are and the way people perceive them and perhaps tolerate them, and if you were able to pull anything out of either or any of the modeling exercises to that effect. Yeah, so that's what I tried to show in that um, slide where um, I haven't, you know, because these are master's projects and they're done like quite o over short periods. I've never, each sort of project is looked at separately. So this is the first time that I've actually collated all the, okay. the data. And um, yeah, in theory, one sh can do like a meta-analysis on the actual data. So bring in all these studies and do the proper stats. But for, for here, I just wanted to see if there were like common trends across the, all these different case studies. So the, um, the most, the two most obvious 
um, patterns were that it was uh, that it's not the monetary damage that drives tolerance, but it's the non-monetary damage and the non-monetary benefits. The monetary uh, benefits, we haven't had many case studies where we've been able to apply it because most don't, people don't actually receive monetary benefits. Um, yeah, so those are seem to be, you know, with some exceptions, those are the main trends. And then the, the other variables, the exposure and the experience and the positive and negative meaningful events, they're less um, consistent over the case studies. So in some cases they are, in some cases they're not. So that's where I said for those you'd have to, management would have to be on a case-by-case -case study because sometimes exposure does, more exposure does create more intangible costs and less intangible benefits. In some case, for some species, it doesn't. Um, yeah. I was curious about, um, I mean, you have many different variables in your model, and I know that intangible costs, intangible benefits came out as being quite important in understanding tolerance. I was wondering if, you know, if, if you had sort of a big um, takeaway from all of this that you would say, as far as like what, what truly drives tolerance, like across these different systems out of all the variables that you looked at, you know, what, what do you feel like would be probably one of the most important factors? Yeah, so I think the also, because one can look at the strength of the path coefficients, and so, um, the benefit intangible is definitely seems the strongest. It's always the strongest sort of driver, and empathy is also coming out to be a very strong driver. So that was kind of also the idea of the social learning workshops to improve sort of empathy, and it seems that it is, you know, it can potentially have a um, a big impact. And that reminds me actually of a quick follow-up question I had about how you were operationalizing empathy, particularly in the surveys, you know, the, like the kinds of questions that you would ask to get at that concept. Mm -hmm. So I used, um, there's the, um, uh, what do they call it, the IRIN um, um, survey, which is used for people, like cross-culturally, and um, so in my in initial, for my PhD, I did the one on people and on animals, so I modified that to animals, to species. So for example, one statement is, um, when I see another person in distress, I often try to see things from their perspective or something, or yeah, something like that. So, so then I just used it for when I see a kudu, like, having problems, I often don't feel sorry for it or mm -hmm. something like that. Thanks. In the results that you walked through, you mentioned um, economic status as a factor, demographic factor. So I was wondering if you noticed any other patterns of impacts on other demographic factors on the intangible costs and benefits that people reported. Yeah, so in my wildlife tolerance model, when I did those reviews, um, it turned out that socio-demographic factors were not a very good predictor of sort of attitudes. So mostly, um, so they're not part of the wildlife tolerance model as such. But of course, I do collect that. We do collect that for each surveys, and we do check. Um, so for example, when I was doing the comparison between Namibia and Zambia, we controlled for for all of those socio-demographic variables, and yeah, they weren't significant. Um, yeah. And yeah, the wealth is obviously an important one because that could affect um, costs, and so far it doesn't seem to be a factor. Again, this may be related to the demographic question, but. Um, in creating your model or in any aspects of your research, did you notice any differences um, in gender tolerance or the level of tolerance based on? Um, yeah, so, so in the model, in the review, it also wasn't um, a factor. So in some studies it was, some it wasn't. So it wasn't a consistent thing. Um, 
but yeah, I know in the literature in general, especially with empathy, um, there's quite a strong indication that women have higher empathy than men. So, but I haven't, yeah, looked at that specifically. Thank you. Yeah. I have two questions. The first one is on the modeling method. So you said you use PLS uh, rather than SEM. Um, and you mentioned that because PLS is more exploratory and SEM structure equation modeling is more confirmatory, to my understanding. Is there another reason for that? Can, and can you, could you have used SEM, structure equation modeling method, to test all of uh, in all of your studies? So that's the first question. So I wonder why you use PLS only, not SEM. The second question is the monetary tangible cost and benefit. Because you mentioned that these are not significant when you are summarizing all the studies. And one reason I think you mentioned is you didn't get the data. So people don't really can uh, perceive that monetary benefits or costs uh, with their tolerance when dealing uh, with uh, wild animals. Um, so the insignificant path, is that because of lack of data? Or it's actually a potential significant factor if it is more common. Because I'm thinking in this in the context of Chinese conservation, government do pay to the communities and villagers to um, protect wild animals. So there's a payment. Um, so that's more common in China. So I'm wondering if uh, would you think that such monetary tangible cost and benefit, well, benefit mostly, will be a significant factor in that context. Okay, so um, in terms of the difference between the PLS and the, um, um, the other yeah, SEM. SEM, yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember now because, yeah, for most of the stats I work with a statistician, so I'm not um, very like. Um, but I think the, the PLSM, yeah, it was mainly exploratory and also there's some other um, reasons to use it. it um, yeah, I think you don't need, um, it has a stronger um, a power effect and I think you need less of a sample size and yeah, the various it's in my paper, you can read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because when, when we submitted it to Biological Conservation, before they even sent it out to review, that was the first question that the editor asked, like, why haven't you got um, testing different models and, yeah, all these things. So, yeah, we had to respond to those <laughs> questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, in terms of the monetary costs, I wasn't quite sure what you were saying there, but in terms of if it's a question of not enough data, because, um, yeah, so when we ask people about the monetary costs, we ask them, like, how much damage have you had? And then if they say, like, lost one or two cows, then you would say, well, how much is a cow? valued and then you'd work out or if it's a crop um, you know what proportion of the crop and yeah. people know very well like you know the value of um, how about the benefit monetary benefit because the thing you mentioned oh monetary only, benefit yeah monetary benefit. Yeah. Um, yeah so in cases where they are like they were in Namibia they do have kinds of uh, compensation schemes so we did I did include that as a monetary benefit but um, in these models, we ended up not really using the actual monetary benefit because for some things it was just impossible to work out. Like people didn't really know. You know, they say it, it's, you know, tourism does bring in monetary benefits, but they can't say how much. So we ended up just, so we had that and we had a, a Likert scale of just, their perception of the, the monetary benefits on a scale of one to five. Mm -hmm. So that was what we used in the models. And it's not a, it's not a significant factor to drive uh, tolerance. Yeah, so we haven't, I say it wasn't, um, I think there were about eight 
case studies and so not all the 15 but um, yeah the thing about the non-significance of the monetary um, things is that I mean all these models are saying is that the more monetary costs or benefits you have people are more tolerant but I guess it doesn't mean that for each person money isn't important it just means that you know the more money the higher um, you know costs it's not related to tolerance so in in terms of compensation you know whether that can have a um, effect or not um, I think you know we haven't wanted to say that you know that compensation is not going to help we're just sort of saying that it's not necessarily going to buy tolerance because um, yeah it's more these other sort of factors so we wouldn't want to say stop the compensation schemes because they're not doing anything yet but yeah I think it's definitely would be useful to explore that more in a sort of other ways you know besides the wildlife tourist model okay. Great. well let's thank Ruth again coming. Our next talk is going to be on October 23rd, and it's Sophia Nani, who's another one of our visiting scholars, who's going to be talking about human-puma interactions in the Chaco in Argentina. Um, so stay tuned. We'll be sending out announcements for those. We'll have other talks later this semester, but that's the next one. Okay, thank you.